I'm going to try and present a, f a couple of visualizations uh, of the eye tracking data that um, I've kind of worked on recently uh, since the film. In fact, one of them I programmed yesterday, so it might be a little bit raw. Um, so, Okay, uh, uh, the first thing uh, is the, the spotlight type animation that we actually saw in the film. And this is basically just playing back the movements in real time. This is the, uh, the first uh, person in the film, uh, Jung, who was uh, naive to Kandinsky. Um, so uh, I'm having a little trouble because I can't get the display to clone, so I'm uh, having to work off there. Uh, so the first type of visualization I wanted to try to do was um, something that gave more of a uh, temporal type of, of um, information. In other words, what do, what do people start out looking at? Uh, do they start in one area and then explore other areas? Um, so, So this is, uh, I'm not sure how visible this is, but um, this is kind of a map. Uh, it's not really a heat map uh, like, like we saw before. It's a map that goes over time. The, stuff, this, the things that you look at to begin with are colored blue, and the thing that, that you look at towards the end are colored red, and there's sort of a transition between them, so the, the stuff that's sort of pink is the, the things that you're looking at in the middle. And this is about a three minute period. So, uh, I mean, the general pattern is that um, he sort of seems to start out in, the, in that central region and then start exploring, you know, towards the end of the, the time he starts exploring different features um, so I thought it would be interesting to compare some of the different uh, people in the film um, and see how the patterns differ. Um, this is the, uh, this is actually John. Uh, so uh, I, I mean, it's sort of a similar pattern, it looks like to me, but although it looks like there's a little bit more exploration, uh, sort of of the different features. And we can see that he sort of does stay in a kind of central region of the painting. Uh, he doesn't really go to the edges very much. Um, Now we see uh, Carol, who's a curator. Um, and this one is quite different. Um, it sort of really goes all over from the beginning, and it goes right, right across the whole, um, it sort of covers the whole painting pretty much, um, edge to edge, although we still do see a concentration in that in that sort of central area with a sort of cross hatching or the part that looks like houses or whatever you want to call it. And, and we, do, we also see some concentration in, uh, in, on some other features. And finally, uh, Julian, who's the artist, uh, I think he was the last person. Um, and this one really kind of goes sis almost systematically all over the canvas. Um, 
So that's that's one one visualization is to try and give the element of time. Another one, another thing I, I tried was to um, was kind of inspired by that idea of taking a stroll through the painting. <clears throat> um, so giving something like a title chart, uh, for example, something like this. Uh, this is a title chart of New York Harbor, uh, at least the New Jersey side of it. So to sort of try and diagram, are there, are there sort of currents in the painting that move your eye one way or the other? So as opposed to the usual um, diagramming of fixations, this is actually diagramming the movements. Where do, where do the movements go? Um, and I'll start out, uh, I'll start out by just doing part of the first person uh, so we don't kind of get overwhelmed. Um, so this is just showing the first 30 seconds or so. And we can see a kind of, this is kind of the Grand Central Station here, and then there's all these circular movements to different features around the, that sort of are more around the periphery, although not, not all the way out. Um, Next, we try, let's just try looking at the whole thing for, for John. And we again have kind of a, that, a similar pattern, uh, except there's more movements, obviously, because we're showing the whole period. And we have some more sort of, uh, we have a, a few concentrations on other features. Um, this is uh, Carol, the curator, and uh, we can see this uh, pattern that really goes kind of almost edge to edge, and uh, we still do have this concentration uh, in this in this region, but we also have sort of going over um, these other regions. So so people who are sort of expert in the in the uh, in this field seem to be able to cover more regions of interest in the same amount of time, which makes sense, I guess. Um, then the final one uh, I really like because this is almost like a machine. This is the painter. Um, and this really is just covering every square inch pretty much systematically. Um, OK, so that's. That's the other visualization. I'll, I'll also mention that in this, this visualization also indicates the speed of the movement. Um, each of the arrowheads is a tenth of a second. So you can actually see that some of these movements are, are quite uh, long relatively, even though they're movements. So I don't know if you would classify that as a, in the smooth pursuit or uh, that, um, I, that, I guess that would be a question I would have. Um, okay, uh, do I have any more time or? 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, well in that case uh, I'll just make one observation about peripheral vision, which is that um, it, I used to watch the Knicks when they were good about 30 years ago, and so I know that it is possible for a point guard to 
see, perceive something which is over here in their field of vision accurately enough to pass the ball perfectly to the person who's over there. So that, that perception does exist and, uh, you know, apparently can be trained to some extent. Um, so for what, for what that's worth. Uh, and I guess we'll go to the Q&A now. I kept getting the feeling that there might be the possibility that even without knowing it, people knowing you were eye-tracking them were being a bit performative, like, oh, I'm supposed to look like an artist, I'm supposed to look at this like a curator. You know, and it's not something you would even consciously be aware of, but you might actually have a different eye-tracking pattern, given the fact that you just knew somebody's watching me watching. That was one of the questions. I want to know, is there any, I want to know if there's any, um, you know, way of accounting for that. Um, and, um, yeah, let's start. That's, that's good. Let's, let's do that. Well, well let's, let, let, let me give one answer and let John, as a participant, give one answer. Um, my answer is, I was just trying to generate some ways of looking at this picture, and I didn't, you know, for me, it, it was not, it didn't have any scientific basis. I was just okay. wanted to see what it felt like, or find different ways to make animation paths through the picture that I didn't deliberately make decisions about. It was more like a, the whole project in a way for me was more like a kind of John Cage gesture than a scientific experiment. But I was very happy that it kind of moved in the scientific direction. So, so yes, for me, it, I, I didn't care about that. But for you, John, you should think about, yeah. No, I, I, I would say, how could you not? Um, you're there with the lights on and the camera. So, but, but at the same time that you look at it, you know, you, your mind drifts and, and how well can you control your performative self anyway? So you go for something and then, you, oh no, that's not quite right. And you change, you know, it's, it's, so it's all, a mix. Yeah, all the turmoil going on. And then, so, and then the, the second half of my question is, what's your confidence based on, obviously you haven't done it yet, but based on what you've seen, that this could be predictive. I know which one in a different painting is the curator and which one is the artist, which one is that individual. Do you think there's any data there? Do we know by looking at the, at the visualization who it is? Yeah, do you think you'd be able to you know, say, oh, I'm, someone's walking up to a painting and looking at it, I can sort of <coughs> get a lot of identification. Yeah, I wonder what the categories would turn into. I guess that's what I would say. Well, I mean, I don't think it's anything like a controlled experiment, but it, I think it's suggestive. Um, you know. Does it map on the expert driver versus the novice driver? I mean, that's what was implied in your... In well, that's what it looked like. Uh, I'm not claiming that uh, it's conclusive. Um, I mean, I think some of it may be driven by, um, well, I think you mentioned that chess experiment before that phenomenon mm -hmm. uh, that sort of chess players see a board in three or four fixations and can remember. Act actually, if I remember that experiment right, um, it, it was a little uh, more complicated than that. Like, if you showed them a position that came up in a game, they could do that. If you showed them in a position that where the pieces were just randomly placed on the board, they were not much better than novices. Um, and so what's, what seems to be going on is that they've seen that configuration so many times in a game that uh, it's like a unit for them. Or so something similar might be going on here, I guess. I will say, I, I will say on, this, on this question, the one thing that I learned is I'd looked at this painting a tremendous amount, of course, before we did the experiment, and I didn't realize that I was drawn to this particular area. I mean, one doesn't know as a, as a, as a subject how, where one is looking or where one is drawn to. So in a way, the data kind of shows you something and I think showed each participant something that they didn't know in advance. Or, and so it's, it has a kind of uh, a reflexive aspect that I think is very, very interesting to, just to people who participate. Thank you. Yeah, to try to connect my question and comment to what was just said, I mean, I think one of the things that a, that a curator or an art historian would, or an artist would, would uh, come to that picture with is a keen interest in composition, which is uh, an issue that we always talk about in, 
in art, and, and that was a, you know, a subject of debate in terms of the landscape from the 18th century onward, a huge you know, literature about you know, how do we look at a landscape. And in that sense, I think that Kandinsky is actually very conservative. And to just talk about his abstraction is to really miss the conservatism of the way in which he composes that scene, which classically places the most important thing dead on. It places the viewer at a kind of elevated perspective on this kind of panoramic view of the landscape. And so then we approach it, I think, as, you know, especially someone who knows something about you know, the kind of theories of landscape, we approach it with a kind of expectations of how we're going to look at it that, are, that very much come from tradition and that aren't so much about abstraction. And, and that's what really seemed to me be, to be borne out by those visualizations of you know, how the curator looked at it. Well, because of course, you know, she's looking at the kind of layering of these elements on the picture surface, but understanding that it was all structured in this very, you know, almost symmetrical way, but also very balanced kind of composition. Absolutely. Yeah. Good point. Um, I just wanted to comment, obviously it wasn't a controlled experiment, but it seems to me that, especially with all this talk about the subconscious mind, that you could probably say, I'm supposed to look at this in a certain way analytically, but after about 30 seconds, uh, if the art is compelling enough, your eyes are going to be drawn, you're not even going to be making conscious choices anymore. I mean, uh, very few people have that level of control. So I think it probably, it's probably pretty no, I'm, I'm, valid. I'm very glad you made that point, because one of the things that, that doesn't show up in, in the film, because I just kind of took sections, is we asked each person to look at this thing for three minutes, which is a tremendously long time. You're sitting with your chin on this thing, and, you know, and, and have all this kind of apparatus around you. And so maybe, yes, for the first 30 seconds, you were in your role. But by that, after that, we notice people kind of relax in different ways. So you're, you're absolutely right. Forgetting what they forgot to buy at the grocery store. Absolutely. Well. But the picture's in front of them all the time. Um, John, I'm, I remember that you said that um, you were thinking about the river formation in the bottom of the painting and it subjectively reminded you of things. And then I just saw in the analysis of your painting that you were actually focusing, I don't know, it says on the house formations or whatever. So I was just wondering what your immediate reaction yeah, to no, that I was. I thought it was the same. I think it's a great question. I think it, it when he was talking about uh, the laser and the flashlight, you know, so and also what Graham said that about what you learn, like it, in in my memory and in my experience of the painting, that's what that's what's there. So when I thought about it to create the talk, and when I thought about it afterwards, what was there was that form. So um, and I also thought, well, maybe my eyes follow a kind of a default pattern when I'm not sort of consciously controlling them. When I pass the 30 seconds and they're kind of released, they just go where eyes go. Like if you put a target on the wall, you find a, your eyes will fall into it. But while, I'm, while that's happening, while the eyes are kind of doing their instinctual thing, I'm, the river memory is fighting its way up. That's what was happening. And later when I process it, it's like, oh, that was really a tremendous experience that this evoked somehow. And maybe that's a good thing for art to do with these symbols and these low, lower um, memories to, to come up. So um, it may only take a very tiny time to evoke something. You know, a, a, it's called a trigger, you know, because it's a trigger. And so maybe the amount of time you spend on something has, you know, has less to do with what you're thinking and seeing. 